you can know all the things. And that was one of the things that really got me interested in the field of neuroscience was how can we can know all the things and still be doing the things we don't want to be doing, which is the hotbed of shame and judgment and criticism. I know better. But that's one of the most devastating things we can say to ourselves. I know better. Hi, this is Danae. I'm the founder of Simple Families. Simple Families is an online community for parents who are seeking a simpler, more intentional life. In this show, we focus on minimalism with kids, positive parenting, family wellness, and decreasing the mental load. My perspectives are based in my firsthand experience raising kids, but also rooted in my PhD in child development. So you're going to hear conversations that are based in research, but more importantly, real life. Thanks for joining us. Hi there, and thanks so much for tuning in. That voice you heard in the intro is Dr. Kate Truitt. I wasn't planning on airing this episode for another month or so, but in light of the recent events in Texas, a place very close to my heart, now feels like the right time for this conversation. Something that I've been working on behind the scenes here is relaunching my psychotherapy practice. For the past few years, I've been doing coaching, I've been working on the podcast, writing a book, but what I keep hearing time and time again is there aren't enough therapists. There isn't enough mental health support out there. So I've been working on updating licensure requirements, getting credentialed on insurance panels, doing lots and lots of continuing education, learning about new innovative treatment options in the field. And that's how I came across Dr. Kate Truitt. So Kate introduces us today to something called havening. And I just wrapped up a six or seven hour training on the use of havening, and I've been using it with myself and with my own kids. Havening is a tool that has really helped me to find calm and peace and to ease my anxiety. And it's also one that I have found very easy to teach my kids. And it's something that I'm going to be integrating regularly into my therapy practice, especially teletherapy, because it's something that can be done to oneself. In our chat, Dr. Truitt, who I'll call Kate in this episode, explains how Havening really saved her after suffering years of PTSD. Kate describes Havening as a bubble wrap for the amygdala, which is the part of the brain that fires and overreacts, and easily gets out of control. After recording this episode, and even saying in my chat with Kate that I have a hard time pronouncing amygdala, 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 my podcast manager, Negan, said to me after she edited it, Danae, do you realize that you said amygdala wrong the entire episode? Even when Kate said it correctly to you, you still said it wrong back to her? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> which I just kind of had to laugh about because, you know, that's just me being human, not able to pronounce important words, actively mispronouncing words that other people are saying correctly to me. And I can assure you that I spell the word amygdala even worse than I say it. So leading into the episode, if it is going to drive you totally bonkers that I mispronounce the word amygdala throughout this entire episode and I use it a lot, then you might want to skip this one. On second thought, if it's going to drive you totally crazy that I mispronounce this word, maybe you're someone who finds yourself bothered by little things, and maybe you need this episode and havening more than most. I hope you enjoy my chat with Kate, and I invite you to check out her YouTube channel where you can actually see what this looks like in action. It's really simple. Thanks so much for tuning in. Hi, Kate. How are you? I'm doing just fine. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining me. So I just wrapped up, I don't know, was it six or seven hours of training with you, a virtual training. So I feel like I know you, um, but I've never actually talked to you before. Yeah. Well, that's kind of the the world of the virtual experience, (laughs) isn't it? So I'm delighted that we have the opportunity to connect and dig a little bit deeper today. Yes. So tell me about yourself. Tell me what you do. So I am a clinical psychologist uh, out here in Los Angeles, California. I have a 
group practice that I get to, I, and I feel very blessed to say get to, uh, run and manage with an incredible team of clinicians. And then I also have a training organization and I run a nonprofit that's focused on the integration of neuroscience into mental health. And so all of those experiences come together and the larger purpose and vision is how do we empower people to really understand what's happening in their brain, especially when we have those wackadoodle human moments that we're so quick to judge and shame ourselves about. And how do we also disseminate access to tools and break down barriers regarding stigma and the very, and, and really enhance the knowledge around the fact that we have so much capacity for self-healing within us. Yeah. And I think neuroscience is so intimidating. It's so mm-hmm. complex. And I think we lose a lot of people in the lingo. Um, have you found that it's possible to make it a little more approachable for your clients? Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the foundation of everything that we do. Absolutely. It's the, it is complex and it can be scary. And if we really pull back and remember that knowledge is power, when we can acknowledge that our brains are fundamentally designed to keep us safe, then we have a different way of having a conversation about neuroscience because we can look at, oh, these experiences that are happening in my brain are having these effects on my emotions and my thoughts and my behaviors. And how do we help that make sense and then create change from that? Yeah. Do you feel like this is a shift in the field of psychotherapy where more and more clinicians are integrating knowledge of the brain and basic neuroscience principles? Slowly and yes. Okay. Yeah. And I feel like when I'm a clinical social worker and never in any of my training was this, was anything related to neuroscience involved. Um, and I now as, as a mother and as a clinician myself, I just feel there's so much power in understanding just a tiny little bit Mm -hmm. about your brain. And I've been teaching my kids a little bit about the amygdala after, after doing your training. And it's funny because the word amygdala, like not only is it hard to say, but it's also hard to spell. Um, but it's, it's, it makes so much sense. Can you tell us a little bit about the amygdala and why it's such a big deal to you? Yeah. To all of us really. (laughs) Yeah. Right. (laughs) (laughs) So, um, the amygdala, which we lovingly call Amy just makes it a little more uh, accessible, if you will, is a foundational part of how our brain supports us in making sense of the world. And it's a very rapid information processing part of our system. In fact, it receives information four times faster than our thinking brain does. And so often when we think think that we're making rational choices and, you know, behaving in the ways that we do in our day-to-day lives, what we don't realize is our amygdala and all of these other more primal brain parts are playing a really critical role. And so the amygdala is really important in helping us feel all the feels, the difficult ones and the really amazing ones. But our amygdala really gets involved when we start to feel upset or scared or stress, worried, any of those kind of more difficult feeling states. And it plays a really critical role in our survival. And so when we've gone through or survived difficult, hard things, and it's fair to say that right now we've all been in a couple of years of some pretty hard things what we see in the literature and in the labs is our amygdala actually starts to change the way our brain is functioning and guides the way we're thinking and feeling. And so as somebody who's been studying the amygdala for 20 years now, I started out working in rat labs a gazillion years ago, um, knowing this information and then knowing how to bring the amygdala into not just the therapy world, but also our day-to-day lives creates so much personal empowerment. And I love that you're talking to your children about Amy and the the role of that. And I'd love to hear. So when you're having those conversations, how is that showing up? How is that coming in? Yeah. So um, have you ever heard of the book Poppy and the overactive amygdala? Yes. Okay. So there's an image in that book, which I love that book. I think it has so many amazing tools for parents in there and kids too. Um, There's an image in there where the thinking brain and the amygdala are both highlighted. 
and the amygdala is really big and it's sucking all the blood. You can like see it has blood coming out and the thinking brain is wearing glasses and it has like a little thought bubble and it says, dude, save some for me. (laughs) <laughs> and that I, that has been just pivotal in these conversations with my kids because it's like, you know, I mean, obviously there's a million different parts of the brain, but the the idea that when your amygdala takes over and it gets really fired up, your thinking brain can't make good decisions. So how yes. do we calm down the thinking brain? And yeah. that, or, or how do we calm down the amygdala? And that's like that's that's all I've really told them. Like they're they're six and eight, so that's, that's where we cut it off. But um, that image has been really helpful for them. Yeah, and and so real. Yeah, and so real. And I mean, I, I invite everybody who's listening to just reflect on that image that Danae just described, because we assign so much responsibility to ourselves and the quote unquote choices we're making when in those activating moments our thinking brain is going, can I have something, please? I just like a little bit of oxygen and some water. And our thinking brain is our choice maker. Yeah. And so often when we or our kids are behaving in ways that are quote unquote undesirable, Mm -hmm. we, we think that it's a choice, but it's often not a choice. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Well, that's exactly where the amygdala and her wonderful relationships with all of these other brain areas play a critical role. So our system starts processing information way before our thinking brain's available. And so a, a fine example of this is one of my favorite examples is to blink your eyes one time. And that eye blink is the amount of time it takes for choice to be actually consciously available to us. That's 35 milliseconds, 350 milliseconds, excuse me. There's a lot going on before that eye blink happens in terms of how our brain's making sense of the world. And all of that other stuff is being informed by the experiences of our past, what we've learned about who we are, how safe or unsafe the world is, how, how well we slept the night before. And people are not given the really real information that so often when we think we're making a choice, it's highly, highly informed by the experiences of our past and even the experience of of what happened five minutes ago. Yeah. And so choice is a experience that is a lot more complex than we give credit to. And then when we're having really big emotions and we think we're making choices And then we don't understand why we're making the choices we're making. That creates a new opportunity for reframing it and saying, wait, what was going on to lead to that experience so that I can now start to step back and better understand myself in that moment? Yeah. I was thinking a little bit in preparation for this talk about schemas that Mm -hmm. really activate my amygdala. And I came up with two that um, I'm wondering if you hear in your practice from mothers. Um, One is, I think I have this schema that kids shouldn't talk back. That Mm -hmm. was instilled in me from an early age. And when they do, I get really activated. Yeah. 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 And the other one is, my kids shouldn't cry and they shouldn't whine because it's my job to make them happy. Okay. So when they cry and whine, yeah. what happens? Mm-hmm. Right? My amygdala goes goes crazy there. And I think that so many of us have these schemas, especially when it comes to parenting. And we don't even notice when they're coming up. Yeah. Well, and uh, so, so schema is a pattern that our brain has developed across the course of our lives for how we make sense of the world in the moment. And what what I love that you just said there, Danae, which is so real for all of us, is it's based on the experiences of our past. And uh, Dr. Lois Kozolina, who's a phenomenal uh, neuroscientist, talks a lot about how 90% of our present moment is defined by our past. And that 90% is those schemas. And so in our present day life, our, our brain is doing rapid fire processing based on those patterns. Yeah. And when we're not aware or when we're running on autopilot, which we do the bulk of the time, autopilot's a very normal thing. Those schemas run our show. And I mean, just hearing those two 
okay, I learned that kids shouldn't talk back. And if my child's upset, I'm doing something wrong. Right. Whew, that is a heavy burden to navigate the world of parenting with when parenting is already pretty, pretty tough. It's a lot of work. Yeah. You, you had a quote in your training that said, the amygdala is always chiming in on present day experiences and using the data of our past to help us evaluate, make sense of, and respond to the present. And I love that because, right, it's part of our brain is functioning way beyond our awareness. And when it overreacts or when it behaves in ways that we'd rather it not, we get really judgmental about ourselves. Mm-hmm. And the judgmental experiences, when we look at it from the amygdala's point of view, are there to keep us safe. Mm. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah. Yes. Our our brain is pretty counterintuitive a lot of the time. It's always looking at the world saying, what are the things that I need to do in, in order to stay safe? I talk a lot about the amygdala having three core values. How am I safe? How am I lovable? And how can I be successful? And success is not about dollars in the bank. Success is how am I making sure I'm getting all of my needs met and all of the needs of those that I love and care about? What am, what am I doing to fulfill my role in this world? And when we've had interesting or all the way down to very difficult experiences in our life, our brain can work in a counterintuitive manner to say, I'm going to judge myself so that I don't make a mistake I've already made in the past. I'm going to beat myself up because I've learned that there are things about me that are unacceptable or put me in the category of not being safe or not being lovable. And in many respects, it's as though our brain is always looking out for us and saying, hey, I'm going to hurt me first so that you can't hurt me. I'm going to manage me more compulsively in some respects, then you could possibly manage me. I'm going to over control myself so that I know that I'm okay in the world I'm living in. And as children, especially children growing up in complex or painful environments, some of those things make sense as a really critical survival strategy. But if they propagate across the course of our lives, they just build and strengthen themselves and cause a lot of pain and disruption later. And ultimately, our amygdala's job is to help us get through every moment and every day. Our brain's number one goal is to keep us alive. It just doesn't always feel good in the ways that it's learned to do so. Yeah. So is the amygdala responsible for the, the fight or flight reflex? Yeah, it's a critical response. part. In, yeah, and fight, flight, freeze, as well as fawn, which is people-pleasing. And interestingly, and this isn't spoken about a lot, the amygdala also plays a critical role in confidence and courage and bravery and strength. So it's big on both sides of the equation, survive and thrive. We're going to pause for a three minute break from today's sponsors. The first sponsor is Manscaped. Father's Day is just around the corner. Manscaped is famous for their skin safe trimmers, their luxury nail kits, and they're all in one grooming kits. Give him something that he'll actually use this year, like the electric nose hair trimmer, otherwise known as the weed whacker. We all know that dads love their comfort. With summer just around the corner, Manscaped has the Boxers 2.0 that are intended to save every father from the uncomfortable heat. So whether he's mowing the lawn, taking out the trash, golfing in the sun, the moisture wicking boxers breathe without breaking a sweat. There's definitely something here that will be a hit with every man in your life, not just the dads. Get 20% off plus free shipping with the code simple at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Use the code simple. That's M-A-N-S-C-A-P-E-D.com with the code simple. Our second sponsor is Daily Harvest. Daily Harvest is something that I saw advertised on Instagram and Facebook for years and always wanted to try it. And now that I have tried it, I love it. It's not very often that you find healthy, delicious frozen meals that are delivered right to your doorstep, but Daily Harvest truly does it well. They were originally known for their smoothies, but have branched out into all different types of foods. I especially love their flatbreads, which are gluten and dairy free. They make a pear and arugula version. That is probably my favorite. 
With Daily Harvest, I never have to question if the food I'm eating is good for me. Takes a lot of the brain power out of it. I don't have to analyze every single thing because I know it's good for me. So if you found yourself eating the kids' leftovers once in a while, I know I do, give yourself something delicious and nourishing. Go to dailyharvest.com slash simple, and you'll get up to $40 off your first box. That's dailyharvest.com slash simple for up to $40 off your first box. dailyharvest.com slash simple. Our third sponsor for today is Pear Eyewear. Pear Eyewear is a new sponsor on the podcast, and to be honest, I wasn't quite sure what I was going to think about their product. But after giving it a try now, it's pretty cool. And also kind of a minimalist stream when it comes to glasses. Here's how it works. You can change your glasses like you change your clothes. First, you get started by choosing a base frame. I chose clear. And then you pick top frames, which you attach to the front, so you can change up the color and the design and the look. So it's one pair of glasses with an infinite number of colors and designs that you can attach to it. Not only do I love it, but my eight-year-old is pretty desperate to get glasses now because he thinks it's so amazing. So try it out. Get glasses as unique as you are. One pair, infinite style, starting at just $60. Go to paireyewear.com simple for 15% off your first purchase. That's 15% off at pair, P-A-I-R, eyewear.com forward slash simple. Thanks so much for supporting our sponsors. They help to keep this show in business. Back to our episode. So I imagine that not everyone's amygdalas are created equal. Can you speak a little bit to the nature versus nurture aspect of it? Ah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot there, right? There is a lot there. Um, you know, our, our amygdala comes online and starts processing and helping and helping us make sense of the experience of our life and our world while we're still on the womb in the third trimester. And whenever I'm speaking with parents, I want to be really, really conscientious and mindful to highlight that a, a, a brain shifts, change and develops across the course of one's lives. And so just because there's a complicated pregnancy, complicated birth, you know, the first several years, I have so many patients that we're working with who, um, you know, gave birth to children during the pandemic. All of those things does not define the child's course of life because the brain is plastic. It changes and develops and sh- shifts across the course of our lives. And some amygdalae are going to be a little more highly sensitized because of early childhood experiences or even in utero experiences that they've been exposed to. And so that sensitization leaves an imprint, of course, on the nervous system that is developing from that sensitized experience. And that is where we have the opportunity to reflect back on the journey that our own brain has been on and the journey that our children's brain have been on and say with compassionate reality, say this is what has happened. And they, because of these experiences, there might be a little experiences that are a little bit more prone to agitation or anxiety little higher level of vulnerability or even chronic illness or chronic pain or just a sensitization that has occurred. And how do we lean into that with love, compassion, and protection and be even much more mindful not to judge, shame, or criticize because of those experiences? Yeah. So I think that many of us are familiar with psychotherapy, you know, talk therapy. And you talk about other modalities for for treating and and really supporting the amygdala, one being psychopharmacology and one being psychosensory. Can you tell us the difference between those three and how what they look like and how they might work for different people? Yeah. So traditional psychotherapy is has historically been for decades and decades and decades uh, talk based. It's the focus is on shifting the way the brain is using information, whether it be emotional or cognitive or thought based information, creating new neural links in the system so that we have more insight, awareness and are able to reframe or experience our our thinking world in a different way. 
that is what we like to talk about as a top down approach. We're going, if you imagine the top of your head, that's your prefrontal cortex going down and hoping that the talk therapy will change the more primal emotional parts of the system. Psychopharmacology is our use of medications in the field of mental health treatment. And so medications can be incredibly powerful and for some people life changing. And the way medications are currently, they create a large blanket across the entire system. We don't yet have a way that we can say this part of the brain needs a little bit more serotonin, but the rest of the brain is fine. And so instead we blanket the system with the medications, hoping that the system that needs a shift or a change in terms of the, the pharma, pharmacological side will receive the, the, the uh, impact that we're looking for. We know there can be side effects and all sorts of other things that come up. Since the late 1980s, a new field has been emerging that's called the psychosensory field of mental health treatment. And psychosensory means that we're using sensory stimulation to create internal shifts or changes. Now, if any, any of your listeners, or perhaps today, if you've studied anything about kind of Eastern healing, uh, or even had a massage prior to the 1980s, then you'll know, wait a minute, that's been happening in the field of healing for centuries, if not thousands of years. We are sensory creatures at our core. Uh, and Francine Shapiro, who founded a modality called EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, really took a huge leap into the fires of the mental health space and said, what if we didn't just talk? What if we did something else? And, and her leap of faith and her courage and her conviction and her research opened up a whole new way for the mental health field to look at treatment and intervention. And since then, we, were, we kind of look back and go, thank you, because it's real. Yeah, <laughs> We can use our sensory systems to affect major sustainable change in ways that really target the limbic or the emotional systems of our brain. Because as we were just talking about, if our thinking brain's not available, we could have done 15 years of cognitive behavioral therapy, but our amygdala could hijack us away from all of that other talk therapy work. And so now in treatment, we look at an integration model. How are we bringing in all of these experiences for the best change? Yeah. Because if you can't access the thinking brain, then it's not going to do you much good, no matter how much work you've done and how much progress you've made, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You can know all the things. And that was one yeah. of the things that really got me interested in the field of neuroscience was how can we can know all the things and still be doing the things we don't want to be doing, which is the hotbed of shame and judgment and criticism. I know better. Yeah. Uh, that's one of the most devastating things we can say to ourselves. I know. Yes. Oh my gosh. We talk about that a lot on the podcast, the podcast, which I call no better, do better guilt. This idea <laughs> that, you know, the more, you know, the more you learn and the more you think you should be able to apply all these things. And then the guiltier you feel because you can't seem to think about and remember the thing you need to do in the moment. And yes. then it's just the cycle, right? Like, oh, I know I learned this tip on Instagram last week that would be perfect for this, but I don't quite remember what it was and I don't know how to apply it and the shame and judgment there. Mm -hmm. And the cycle. And then, yeah. and, and it makes it worse. The cycle makes it worse because our, I like to talk about how our little friend, Amy, the amygdala is a shame junkie. It's like cotton candy to her. She loves to chew on shame. Ah. So tell us about havening. Uh, how did it, how did it start? What is it? So Havening grew out of a deep dive exploration into that modality. I was just talking about EMDR as well as another intervention called tapping, uh, two doctors, doctors, Ron and Steven Root, and they're actually twin brothers, uh, got really curious about what, it, what is this kind of wackadoodle thing of you're going to track people's eyeballs or tap in different places and all of a sudden phobias disappear. And so this back in the early, early 2000s, they started investigating the underlying neurobiology of these psychosensory modalities. And through their investigations and just 
I mean, it's really cute to hear them tell the story about sitting around the, the kitchen table every night. They they both run private private practices in New York, where you're based. Um, one's a physician, the other one's a, a dentist, and spending hours and hours and hours and their sweet wives looking on going, gosh, really, you're still doing this for a decade <laughs> as they identified and streamlined the underlying mechanisms of trauma encodings, the best that we could based on the literature and found a way to interact with the traumatic encodings and the effects of that through another sensory modality, which was touch. And so going back to if you've ever had a massage and felt a little sleepy afterwards, it turns out that that sleepiness is based on touch down regulating your brain into a slower brainwave state that is the opposite of what happens when we're in an amygdala hijack, when we're highly cortisol driven. And then they said, wait a minute, let's use that and have since that time and now i'm one of the developers and the creators of the tools i've been invited into that space which has been incredible we've been streamlining it and creating protocols for both self-healing as well as clinical intervention to give the amygdala some breathing room help her heal through survival mode or fear mode if she's in it and transition into thrive mode because she wants us to thrive sometimes we just got to let her know she's safe first yeah and while this is often done in a therapist's office, it can also be done to yourself at home, which is so, it's so simple, which is why I love it. But do you get a lot of people saying like, this is, this is made up, like this, is this doesn't do anything? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, um, so my, my story with it. Uh, having, like I said, been studying, um, researching in the field of neuroscience, specialized in fear and trauma for you know, going on 20 years. But when I found out or heard of Havening for the first time, I'd been in that field for about 15 years. And the first time I heard about it, I, I literally started laughing. I thought it was absolutely ridiculous. And um, Bill Souls, who's a phenomenal social worker in New York, uh, mentioned it to me, and he's a trauma specialist as well. And he said, hey, are you familiar with all of these other, we call them the, the acronym soups of trauma treatments. And he's like, yeah, I know you're trained in all of these. Have you heard of this thing called havening? You basically give yourself a hug or you, you know, wipe your forehead or run, rub your palms together. And then you sing some songs and your brain feels better. And I'm a, you know, I'm a psychophysiologist, I'm a neuroscientist, and I'm just like, uh-huh, no. And, and what he didn't know at the time was I was living in the throes of PTSD. I'd had it for five years at that point in time. Um, I had a traumatic loss where my partner of 10 years died a week before our wedding, and I couldn't save his life. And I had given... It was one of those experiences of knowing all the things and still being paralyzed by the thing that I knew so much about and my own shame spirals around that. And when he shared this with me, it, I, it was because I tried all of the treatment interventions and they had helped, but I had given up on ever being able to function normally in my day to day life. I'd actually stopped practicing clinically because I did not feel that I, my brain was safe if a patient walked in my office and brought up a trauma tied to my trauma that I could trust my system to stay present. And so when Bill shared this with me on a wing and a prayer, I said, what do I have to lose? This sounds completely bizarre and I'll try it. And it completely transformed my world. So was your first experience self-havening, doing it to yourself, or did someone guide you through it? My first experience with it was at a, at a training for havening where Dr. Stephen Reed and one of the founders happened to randomly sit down in a breakout group. And I was being cheeky and a little bratty. And he's like, does anybody have something they would like to try this with? And I put my hand up and we, we talk about a scale of zero to 10, where 10 is the most le highest level of activation you've ever had. And honestly, mine was probably at a 30. And <laughs> I was like, sure, I've got something because I was 
challenging and I'm, you know, I'm not, not my proudest moment as a, as a doc. Um, but he applied the havening touch. It can be used self-application or facilitated havening. We teach it almost always in self-application now because it is much, it, it's very powerful for the body to heal itself. Uh, and then he had me sing some songs and play some brain games. And I think within 10 minutes, the super glue of that traumatic encoding that had been following me and running my life for 10 years, five years at that point, felt like it just dissolved. And I remember opening my eyes and looking at him and he said, okay, I want you to go back to the target event. And I'm not going to describe it, obviously, but my, my late fiance's name is John and we called him Johnny Angel. And I felt like I had this warm presence around me when I walked into the room where the experience had originally unfolded in 2009. And I could not for the life of me bring up the trauma. Hmm. It was like, it was just a room again. It was, it was a room that had been a room that I'd been in a thousand times in my life again. Hmm. And so I'm, when you re-entered the room for the first time after one havening experience, the room felt different to you? Well, visually re-entered it. I, I couldn't go back Got to it. that room. We okay. since let the, it, it was a, since the, the apartment had since yeah, been rented out to other people, but yeah. Visually, I could I could not trigger myself, as we would say in the trauma field. I yeah. kept trying to trigger myself after that, and I could not. Wow. Instead, every single time, it was just like, oh. And with grief, I had I had the sweet back. I hadn't been able to connect with the sweet of this amazing 10-year relationship since he passed on because my poor little amygdala would just freak out. And I was like, oh my gosh, and I could go and look at our photos and, you know, and remember all the amazing things without being paralyzed with the, the trauma. Mm. It's like, oh, it's incredible. Yeah. I got my life back. Yeah. <laughs> so, cool. so that, I guess I'm trying to wrap my head around the uses. Yeah. So what you just described is, is oh. using havening to treat trauma. Yes. So can you talk about just different ways that you use it and how that looks in for generalized anxiety or panic disorder, or what that might look like? Yeah, absolutely. And on our YouTube channel, we actually are just wrapping up an entire sequence um, on generalized anxiety and treat, using self-havening to empower the generalized anxiety healing journey. Um, so as we mentioned a moment ago, havening can be used in the clinical space to delink or release traumatically encoded experiences. One of my favorite havening protocols is a specific protocol that targets the neural networks that build after traumatic encoding. And this is basically a trauma is encoded. Now your brain's changed because of the trauma. And doesn't mean you have PTSD. It could be I'm depressed, I'm anxious, whatever it is. We can work with the neurobiology of that to create healing. And then we can also use neuroplasticity to build new pathways forward, help the brain go from th survival to thrive. The thing that I love the most about, ha about havening, even though all that other stuff is incredible and really, really cool, is the self-havening part. Because that personally aligns with one of my biggest missions and visions in my entire life's purpose is how do we give the power of healing back to people? Because just as our skin will recover from a paper cut unbeknownst to us for so long our brain has the capacity to recover too and havening gives us a very simple way in as you said it, it is so easy it seems almost silly how simple it is and with the self havening we have a variety of protocols and one's called creating personal resilience for the amygdala we talk about rubbing wrapping bubble wrap around the amygdala Right after a stressful event has occurred, or if we notice we're having a trigger, we can actually ourselves heal that activated system and help it calm down and not just help it calm, like breath work will calm our body. This will actually help the system soften its links to the traumatic experiences or the stressors. So it's proactive healing. It's neosporin for the brain in our very own hands. And we can use the havening to not just heal, but to also build and empower. It's those schemas we were just talking about were learned. Mm -hmm. We learned our old schemas. Well, guess what? We can use neuroplasticity to build new ones that we want our brain to use instead. 
and the havening touch empowers that neuroplasticity. So I've been kind of playing around with using it with my kids and myself and A month or so ago on the podcast, I talked about anxiety and this big fear, I guess it's probably a phobia that my, my eight-year-old has around characters and costumes. So it's a, it's a big thing. And, um, it's, it's, it's something that we can often avoid, but if you ever go to Times Square, it is filled with characters and costumes. And he, so as a result, Times Square is like his, his trigger spot. Like you just don't go to Times Square. He does not like Times Square. So for Easter, we had tickets to see a Broadway show and we had to go through Times Square. And I, I used havening. I used the hand rubbing the hands together, Mm -hmm. singing twinkle, twinkle, little star. So we, we paused and and I want your feedback to tell me how I could use this better. Um, but it, the, the wrongs and rights, cause I'm not sure I'm doing this right. So right before we saw the characters, I had him pause and we did the self havening. He rubbed his hands together slowly and we sang a song. And then after we saw the first character, a few minutes later, we did it again. Nice. And then we did it again, maybe like 10 minutes later. So we did it three times mm-hmm. and he made it through Times Square, like calmly. It was wow. incredible. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. So what, how would you have used it in that situation? Is that, was I doing it right? I don't ah, think I really knew what yeah. I was doing. Well, and, and just for, for your listeners who aren't familiar with what we're, with the havening touch, uh, if we just... Let's take a little sidebar and describe what that is. So, yeah. so what Danae was talking about with, of rubbing your the palms together. I would just like to imagine if you're washing your hands under warm water, palm to palm, or if you remember at the beginning of the pandemic when everybody would sing songs and to make sure you're washing your hands for the right period of time. And hopefully people are still doing that because that's good hygiene. <laughs> right. um, that's palm havening. And then we also have a havening hug, which if you imagine that you're crossing your arms across your chest, fingertips on your shoulders and moving your fingers down the the tops and the sides of your arms to your elbows. And then repeating that emotion, it's called, I called a moving hug. That's called arm havening. And then finally, there's two touches across the face. One is across the brow. If you've ever had a tension headache, that's exactly what it is. You're just rubbing a right, following your eyebrows. And then the other touches right in, along your cheekbones, underneath your eyes. If you've ever wiped away a tear, it's doing that on both sides of your face at the same time. Those are the four touches that create a specific electrochemical change in the brain. And all of them are very powerful, as Demand just described with her child, just palm on palm that in, engages little receptors in the skin that downregulate the brain. And then singing a song gives the brain an intentional job that redirects it away from what the amygdala wants to freak out about. And, and that, that's the simplicity that can be kind of unnerving almost is... Mm-hmm. So I'm going to rub my, the palms of my hands together very slowly and then sing a song that's neutral or pleasant. And that in of itself will actually create a electrochemical sc- cascade in the system that delinks the fear and the stress from the amygdala. And so Danae, what you just described is exactly how I would have recommended doing it. Prep the system. So you did it before the first interaction with something that was scary or stressful. You wrapped bubble wrap around the brain and let Amy know you're okay. And then you interacted with the first stressful thing. And then immediately thereafter, because some energy might have come up, Amy's going, I don't like it. Once again, let's sing some songs and do a little havening. Okay, now we're calm. Let's keep walking. And then Amy's going again. I don't, I I, I dislike it a little less, but I'm still (laughs) not sure that I'm a fan. And then again, another song. And for parents with children, it is so powerful because of the modeling and the connection. There's so much incredible attunement that is very healing. And Amy, our little amygdala, is relational at her core. She needs safe others. Yeah. So 
this is, I guess we're talking about using it in the moment, but you also advocate for doing sort of creating, um, just a a habit of doing it in the calm moments too. Mm -hmm. Tell me more about that. Yeah. We talk about having a resilient brain care program and just like we go to the gym for our body or take a mindfulness walk. We want to take the same level of care and attention and give it to our brain. And the thing that is so easily lost is that if say we take 20 minutes of our day to tune into our brain's health and well-being, and that's about what a, a solid brain care program can take 20 minutes. That's it. That's like two to 7% of your waking hours. It's nothing but it will transform your ability to show up in your day-to-day life. And the more that we use the tools when we're calm, we're building muscle memory. So schemas are automatic processes that we build across the course of our lives to help our brain be energy efficient. So when we practice self-havening for that two to 7% of our waking hours every day, we're building an automatic schema for self-regulation anytime our little friend Amy the amygdala picks up some dust. She kicks up a concern about something, the brain and the body go, oh, I've got a tool for this. And we don't have to think about it. It becomes an automatic process, Mm, which makes our lives easier. Right, yeah. Oh, that's so great. So I know everyone is listening to this thinking, what does this actually look like? (laughs) Where is the best place to find examples of this and learn more? Uh, so we have a YouTube channel uh, that every week we release psychoeducational videos followed by every Sunday is a guided exercise or psychotherapeutic tool on how do you integrate self-havening uh, into whatever the psychoeducational video was. So the YouTube channel is Dr. Kate Truitt. Uh, it's it's not just me. That's just what the channel is called. Um, it's me and my team. We've created, I think at this point, hundreds of videos uh, and that just started at the beginning of the pandemic when we're like, everybody's amygdala is having a hard time. <laughs> yes. What can think, we do? So that's, I think that's still true. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, and there's, we have specific playlists that we've created for parents and children on there. Um, and even videos to help for every age group for children that children can watch and Haven along with, which mm. is pretty fun. That's great. Do you have like a, is there like a getting started playlist for people who are just beginning? Yeah. The CPR for the amygdala playlist. So CPR stands for creating personal resilience is a really great place to start because that's the bubble wrap for Amy. Okay. I'm going to put the links to all this in the show notes for all those listening. And then on the, the PESI, you mentioned going to the PESI workshop. Um, I've actually written a number of blogs for them. And I, I'll send you those links for those blogs that we've done. We've written up blogs for parents and children specifically on how to integrate the creating personal resilience, the CPR, as well as the havening hug into the parent child dynamic for, to help everybody feel better. Cause that's really what it does. So I'll send those over as well. Oh, I love this. And it is really, truly so simple. Yes. It's, that's the best part. Well, thank you, Kate. I appreciate your time and it's been so great learning from you. And I'm excited to see how this practice really changes and kind of molds as I grow and as my kids grow too. Well, thank you. And I have a Healing in Your Hands book that will be coming out in a couple months that is basically a self-healing journey. Oh, that's so exciting. Um, When is that out? Um, Hopefully, like I said, in a couple months, it's through, it's with PESI as well. Okay. So thinking midsummer, and there's an entire chapter on how to integrate havening into supporting children and the self as a parent so that everybody feels calm and Amy is happy and thriving. Great. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. It's been a joy. I hope you've enjoyed my chat with Dr. Kate Truitt. If you want to learn more about her and about havening, go to the show notes at simplefamilies.com forward slash episode 311. You'll find the info to get in touch with her and the links to the videos there. As always, thanks for tuning in. And I ask you to take just one quick minute to leave a rating or review for the podcast. The ratings and reviews make such a difference for the show. So please leave your support there. Thanks for tuning in and have a good one.